Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast, empowering filmmaking entrepreneurs. Hey, welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast. Yes, this is the podcast where we empower you, the filmmaking entrepreneur. And a great way to get started is to get the book, How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion while doing it. It's available in paperback, Kindle ebook, as well as an audiobook. And in fact, you can get the audiobook for free when you go to survivetheimplosion.com. That's survivetheimplosion.com. Hey, Ron. Good to see you, man. Um, I know yeah, that, good, good to see you. I know that people can't see us because we can see each other in our Skype call, and they're just listening to us on the audio. I noticed you have quite a, a beard, facial hair growing. So tell us about this project you're working on, which requires you to have such a uh, gr- robust facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going for it. So I'm in like uh, just about a month of growth. Never attempted to grow a beard like this before but um i have visions of grandeur of doing a viking film so this is kind of my prelude attempt to do this uh epic viking beard so i don't know if i'm quite hitting that level but the cool thing that i'm doing if, if we had a kind of a crystal ball of storytelling and filmmaking and craft and we talk a lot about trying to exploit our ips and so I did this epic action adventure fantasy called The Rangers. Mm-hmm. And what we're doing is we're doing a completely what we're calling a cinematic experiential immersive event where what would it feel like if you could just walk off into your favorite fantasy film, a la The Rangers. So we are we've created this fully immersive environment at a local winery here. And we have over 200 people that are going to be coming And the moment they get onto the property, it's going to, you're going to leave this world behind and step into the world of Adrasil. And just what is that going to be like from Friday to Sunday? And so we have some LARP weapons to, for combat and all this kind of stuff. We have a whole storyline and arcs and characters that we need to develop and that will play out. But ultimately the players themselves will kind of dictate the storyline so it's going to be a lot of fun then of course as a filmmaker we're going to be recording all this and we're putting together the plan is to put together a a 60 minute pilot uh episode to go around and pitch this thing and see if we can't get this thing picked up i i put together a five minute sizzle before a couple years back and got some traction but of course you know everybody's like that sounds awesome. Go do it. And then we want to, they want you to take, take the risk, right? Mm-hmm. And, and then show them the product. So I am trying to uh, go to that next step and do just that. Nice. What is that? Uh, for those who don't know, what does LARP stand for again? Yeah, no, that that is true. And I had to learn so much about it too. So <laughs> LARP stands for live action role playing. And so, you know, you've seen it a lot on like the film, um role models role models exactly yeah yeah which kind of made it famous and then uh recently there's been a commercial uh you know bad fantasy and good fantasy for fantasy football that uh, espn has put out that got a lot a lot of larpers all all bitter but ultimately it is uh we're seeing it as simply just a device within our kind of kind of story element so super excited about it. it's called weekend warrior so we have a website, weekendwarrior.world, so you can kind of get a sense of, of what we're talking about. And then and the hope is that we can do this maybe two, three times a year, do this live experiential immersive event. VR, we know, is is definitely not even a next thing. It's a here thing. But mm-hmm. um, I think immersiveness, immersive entertainment is what people are wanting. You you went to a Ren fair 10 years ago, and 10% of the people would dress up now it's 70, 80 percent of the people dress up. Yeah. You know, so people are wanting to be invited into it. They don't want to be passive anymore. And Disney's picked this up, too. You know, they've, they've announced this uh, Star Wars. I believe it's like a, a bar or, or something that is going to be immersive. That's mm-hmm. going to allow you to go get a taste of what it's like to step onto, you know, Tatooine and the in the bar there. So. Yeah, we're we're kind of trying to follow follow suit to that and see if we can't get in front of the parade and make this thing happen. Very cool, very cool. All right, we'll we'll you know keep us posted, of course, as we yeah. as we as you progress. So, um, getting on to this particular episode, the, this is actually part two on how to get a named actor and work with SAG for your indie film. 
And uh, today, our uh, guest, you'll hear me interview um, New York independent uh, film director John Gallagher, who's been around for a long time, who's very well versed in film. And you'll hear about like how he used to just like write down the credits after every VHS tape that he watched, you know, <laughs> like before IMDb Pro and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we just kind of get right into it. And I ask him point blank because he's been working in the independent um you know, film world for a long time. Uh, he's had like um, Ice T um, on one of his first films before Ice T was on uh, all those Law and Order shows and so on, and um, coming out of his rap career, going into acting. So you'll hear a little bit of stories like that. So we'll just jump right into it um, here in the Film Trooper podcast, and this is part two of how to get a named actor and work with SAG for your independent film um, with our first guest, uh, New York. Um, independent film director John Gallagher. How would they go about trying to get a named actor um, for their project? Um, and we're, you know, somebody's coming from completely scratch, like you know, just, yeah. uh, and maybe they don't even live in either New York or LA. So, yeah, um, yeah. but everybody has this ability to make films now. So, how how is the best practice way of going about that? Well, you know, it really uh, boils down to two words, casting director. <laughs> uh, a, a casting director who, I mean, the best ones are connected with agents, managers, and talent. They know, you know, who will do uh, an independent film. You know, they, they, they know who care, you know, cares more about the movie and the role than the money, um, and and that truly and, and also, you know, um, they want to see you know a first time filmmaker succeed, uh, so that when they get their ten million dollar movie, that they'll be hired for that. So, um, you know, in my experience, I've been very blessed to work with you know some casting directors who. You know, possess all the criteria that I just mentioned: Judy Henderson, Steve Vincent, and Sig D. Miguel, Caroline Sinclair. Uh, they were all New York casting directors, but that doesn't matter. I mean, they, if you make, well, if you want to make a movie in Iowa, you know, they can do it for you. Um, I mean, I get credit for either you know discovering or casting in significant early. Roles, people like John Leguizamo, Amanda Peet, Gretchen Mull, Zach Braff, Vinny Passore, Matt Lillard. You know, I in, indeed I did cast them, but Judy Henderson brought them in, mm -hmm. and you know, um, so that really is the the best way. Now, obviously, finances are finances are always an issue, um, but it would behoove. A new filmmaker to, you know, just hire a casting director to cast one or two names, you know, and then the that goes out into breakdowns through the casting director with the note, you know, please uh, names only submissions, and it's always amazing to me, you know, some of the people that. You know that that gets submitted because, you know, all the agents and, and all the managers get those breakdowns, and uh, you know, so it's amazing how you know who will you know will come in. Um, yeah. The other thing to bear in mind is with your names, you know, try to you know arrange your shooting schedules so that they work, you know, say two consecutive days, and 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 spread out their scenes if possible throughout the completed film so it feels like you know they're in more of the movie than you know even though they only shot for a day or two um also you know key of course is the well-written actable roles the kind of parts that will get a name actor excited for example in a film i directed uh, called the deli um, we had uh, Ice-T only because he was cast against type. Now, this was 20 years ago. In fact, mm -hmm. we're doing the, uh, the 20th anniversary uh, celebration tonight at the Long Island uh, 
International Film Expo. At that time, ICE was, you know, hardcore, you know, OG. And there was a, a fame in, in the parts he, he played. In the deli, purely a comedic role as the meat man who supplies the cold cuts to the deli. And he jumped all over it. He loved it. Hmm. Um, and didn't charge us a whole lot of money either. Um, so that is really, you know, again, the, the, the advantage of a, a quality casting director is that, you know, yes, you're going to have your list of like your, your wish list, which is usually unrealistic. Uh, they will give you a list as well that, you know, um, maybe somebody from left field that you didn't think about. And that's really, um, you know, a, 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 again, a, a, the great advantage of, of, of a casting director. Um, now, having said that, that certainly is not the only way mm -hmm. to go about it. Um, just to cite... You know, a couple of examples. I showed a movie I directed called Blue Moon at the Sedona Film Festival. Sean Young happened to live there ah. at the time. She came. I, I met her at the opening night party, begged her to come to see the film the next night. She did. Uh, when I got up for the Q&A, she stood up and said, John Gallagher, you're a genius. I must work with you. <laughs> and we tried for many years to do so, and on an extremely low-budget movie I directed, uh, the, most, the mo most recent feature, uh, The Networker, Sean was right there, and she was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so that was from, you know, came from meeting her at a film festival. Um, you know, I mean, Quentin Tarantino was at the Avignon Film Festival and met Mar a Portuguese actress named Maria de Medeiros, and calls her up a year later, says, hey, I'm doing this movie. I want you to play Bruce Willis's girlfriend. <laughs> it was called Fiction. Um, you know, I met, uh, I haven't, well, unfortunately, I haven't worked with him yet. We almost did. But I met Treat Williams that one year at the Fort Lauderdale Film Festival, hmm. where we both had films. Great guy, you know. And, uh, you know, at the Oldenburg Film Festival in Germany, I met many wonderful actors, um, including... Fantastic actress who's a, a name actress in Germany, the most important territory outside the U.S. Mm. Um, in terms of sales, named Lucy Pohl, and she is one of the stars of my next film, Sarah Q. Um, you know, and then there's you know somewhat. Um, I mean, I met Rita Moreno in, in a reading um, of someone's script. And I ended up casting her in Blue Moon. Um, ben Gazzara, who's one of our favorite, favorite, late, great Ben Gazzara, my producing partner, Sylvia Kaminer, met him at the rap party for Carlito's Way oh. and pitched this project, like, in two minutes. A short pitch is important. He gave, gave her uh, his number. We met with him a week later, and he was with us on that project. For the five years it took us to get <laughs> financing, um, and then there's you know, uh, Sylvia was at some Italian restaurant on the west side of Manhattan. Spots where we were in pre-production on the deli. Spots Debbie Mazar hmm. knows that Debbie and Frank Vincent, who was in the film already and uh, done a good friend of mine, um, they had done a, cu a couple of things together. So Sylvia just you know approached her and said, "Hey, we're doing a movie. Would you like to play?" We got a great part for you, Frank Vincent's girlfriend, <laughs> and we got the script to her agent or the manager the next day, and she was on board. And now, you know, she's going to be in. She's also attached to another project I have. And then there's the nefarious ways of going about it. We had one more day to shoot on an 11 day micro budget movie called Men Lie, and uh, so we we were at an Italian restaurant. The uh, the night before, and who do we see across the way but Bud Bundy from Married with Children hmm. was having dinner with a friend. Now, after we figured out that his name is David Festino, <laughs> I got up, strolled past his table, did a double take, and said, David, 
hey, yeah, John Gallagher, how you doing? What are you doing in town? You know, as if I knew him. And I, I said, oh, you know, we're doing a movie. Uh, Martin Scorsese's mom is in it. We're shooting Little Italy tomorrow. I got a great part for you. And he says, well, do you got anything from my friend? I said, absolutely. And uh, I went home, wrote the scene, <laughs> took it to the hotel, and David and his friend did the scene the next day. And, of course, later, you know, when I told him that, you know, I pulled too fast, when he said, no, I knew all along, I had no idea who you were. <laughs> so, uh, and, and he came out and supported the film very much. So, you know, there, there's pretty much... You know, whatever, you know, all's fair and love and independent filmmaking, really. <laughs> um, that's, uh, you know, so so that's a, a really, you know, those are some of the things, you know, that have, that have worked worked for me. I mean, other another kind of note would be try to check with a sales rep, a producer's rep, right. before you make an offer. To an actor, you want to find out, you know, what is the value on the international market, um, you know, for that actor. That again, it's all about the end game. You got, that's research that you really must do, um, and that sales rep will tell you, and sometimes very surprisingly, you know, what we'll do, for example, before we make an offer, we'll like say list five names. And I'll send it to my producer's rep, and I'll say, rate these in order, rate these actors in order of, you know, value, revenue value. Sometimes it's a surprising list. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain actors that say were once, you know, A-list studio players here, um, but then as the years went on, ended up, say, doing cable movies and became less of theatrical names. However, those cable, those movies that played cable here mm -hmm. did play theatrically, say, in Europe or Japan or Australia, and they've maintained their value. Um, so that's, that's really an important... Because you don't want to cast somebody you think is a great name to only to find out that uh, you know, by by some distributors, says, yeah, it's too bad you you, you cast him because uh, he really has no value anymore. Um, you also want to try to focus, and your your good casting director will guide you this way. To and even if they're not like big names, but that they're more current, that they're current, you know, in the sense that maybe they have, uh, you know, they do a Netflix. Show. I mean, look, oh, yeah, you know, TV actors want to do movies. And vice versa these days. Um, <laughs> a current, uh, you know, name or semi name versus say someone who was a big, had, you know, a big TV star in the eighties, you know, and um, you know, and really has you know little value, um, you know. So so those are all things that that one one should do. And of course, again, you're you know. And you don't want to use like an overused actor, like oh my god, like Eric Roberts been was it like seventy movies last year. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's, it's crazy. Um, and, and so so clearly he, I don't know, I don't know him personally. It appears that he will do anything. Yeah, you pay him for the day. I mean I know micro budget movies that 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 have used him. Um, uh, in fact, I know about a half a dozen of them, right. but I personally know the filmmakers. So you know, tr go for a you know a, a more current name because that that the value there you know is just uh, you, you you can't beat that. And then you know you may I've been very fortunate, and my little claim to fame is that there are a lot of name actors who I either you know as I say that either quote discovered or cast in significant early roles so that that is that gives me um a little bit of leverage in mm -hmm. terms of you know well look you know because because again the casting director you know you don't want as the director to go out and blow your own horn and tout what a wonderful talent you are that's the job of the casting director to say oh he's great you'll love him they'll love, <laughs> you know blah 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 bing 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 and, and, and that's that's really good because um you know, the casting director is coming 
from a kind of exalted place. I mean, she is dealing with the agents and managers, I mean, every single day. And, um, you know, so that's, that's really key. I mean, as I said, Judy Anderson, it was the first she, Emmy winner for Homeland, many independent films. Um, she is the first casting director I ever worked with. My first feature, I cast, you know, friends from high school, college, old girlfriends, you know. Uh, it was it was an East Coast Beach movie, and actually New Line picked it up. But there were no names in it, although one of the leads went on to become a pretty big, uh, uh, you know, night, nighttime soap star. Mm-hmm. Um when I first worked with Judy, it was on a film called Street Hunter, an action movie I wrote with the star of the film, Steve James, the late great, um, from the American Ninja movies. And I had no idea. I, I said to Judy, well, what do you say to the when they come in? And she was like, uh, how are you? I'm like, how are you? What, what, are you? what have you been doing lately? What have you been doing lately? And she really held my hand in terms of the audition process mm-hmm. and uh you know and i've worked with her you know i mean not exclusively but you know pretty much ever since we're we're on a project now that we have uh uh jerry o'connell debbie mazar probably hopefully chas palmentary um but it's a little different for me now obviously because i've done you know i've been doing this for god 39 years right like Jack right Benny. And so it's a little different. Also, because I've been teaching film acting for 25 years, um, I mean, I've cast hundreds of actors literally out of my classes. And in many cases, um, you know, I I, I really like to, and this is a a good thing, you know, for a a novice filmmaker to remember, is, yeah, I mean, in your lead, and I've done this a number of times successfully, cast, you know, Talented newcomers um, in your leads, and then and then surround them with names. A day or two here, a day or two there, um, and because it, what's interesting is that when I've done that, always and if it's a very relatively inexperienced new actor, mm-hmm. the minute I put them opposite, you know, Frank Vincent or William Forsythe or. You know their game, you know, raises significantly. Suddenly, it's like, oh man, this, this kid's been doing it for like twenty years. It seems like, <laughs> you know, so that 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 really um, uh, has proven, you know, very helpful over the years. And um, that, uh, you know, for example, the the film I'm doing, hopefully in September, uh, is called Sarah Q. It's about an innocent, naive young actress from. Upstate New York comes to the city to go to acting conservatory and gets into every kind of trouble imaginable. Um, now, the main actors are all from, all trained with me in my classes. Hmm, I see. Um, and so I know what they can do. Um, as a, you know, because I've had them for 10 hours as opposed to 10 minutes or, you know, yeah. five minutes. Or an audition, and that's it. Yeah, you know? but I put in, you know, I, I, uh, you know, five stars of The Sopranos in different roles, and two Academy Award nominees, Burt Young and Sally Kirkland, you know, for a day or two each. So they're surrounded by this caliber of talent, which you know also works great for sales and this is an extremely low budget extremely low budget film um so that's a a good a good way to go and even like with the sopranos guys and as i say this gets back to the iced tea anecdote um all the sopranos guys in the film uh tony sirico paulie walnuts vinnie pastor big pussy they're playing ex-cops <laughs> who are in the knockoff business and, you know, Louis Vuitton bags and so forth. Uh, Federico Castelluccio played Furio, and Frank Vincent, Phil Leotardo, they're actually playing teachers at the conservatory. And Willie DeMeo, um, Jason Molinaro from this Sopranos, is playing a uh, kind of a devious independent filmmaker. So they're all playing against type. 
Um, and that, again, is a great way to entice an actor. I mean, Joey D'Onofrio, who I've worked with many times, he was the young Joe Pesci in Goodfellas. And we've done, I guess we're on our sixth film together. Um, Joey um, yeah, he usually gets cast as a wise guy. Well, in Syracuse, he plays Dr. Bob. He's a dentist. <laughs> so that gets him... You know, really juiced, and, 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 and these guys just, you know, I mean, the level of their excitement on this project is phenomenal. And it's obviously that's a total blessing, you know, for, for us. And we're back. Hey, Ron, what did you think of what John Gallagher's advice was, just point blank? Oh, man. I mean, this guy was, uh, was great. I mean, you could just feel the experience just tri dripping off this guy. And then the passion and his story. Uh, was just uh, was just so catching, you know. And obviously, it was hard not to catch like his biggest point is that casting director. And you know, it's funny because I find myself, I have a feature film that I am trying to get off the ground, right? And I'm at that point of we got a little bit of seed money from a crowdfunding campaign, and I'm trying to attach talent. And it's hard not to look at a casting director. And with John's advice, it looks like. That is the logical next step of where I need to go. But it just seems like he kept throwing out name after name of like, yeah, I worked with this person and that yeah, person. Yeah. It's like, wow, man, this guy was able to really get in. And then, you know, you can't tell by his voice he, to say he's had that much experience, like, you know, whatever, 35 years doing mm -hmm. this. And, and I love the longevity. It gives me hope because an independent filmmaker, you feel like you're going to wipe out you know, right around the corner. It's like, well, I guess that was my last project. You know, I got to hang it up and go do it. And the, and he's had longevity. So a lot of wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. And he's definitely supplemented his, his career with uh, teaching film as well. Like he's got like this uh, master list of, I think, like 100 films that every independent film student should watch or something like that. And I see if I can't get that link to the, uh, the, the show notes um, when we post this uh, episode. But it was interesting because the, the one co uh, concept to, to grab hold there was simply by working with a casting director who has their a good one that really knows sort of the up and coming actors that are coming onto the scene. They could get in on your project and you never know they could take off. I remember several years ago I was being courted by uh, some producers for the, a film project that I was working on and they were like, you really got to maybe look at this kid, Anthony Mackey. You know, <laughs> like, like, you know, this is like, I think yep. he did like one thing or something like that at the time. But I mean, it's um, that stuff happens. But the whole point is, um, if you're able to get some of these, you know, potential stars on the rise, uh, your film has longevity in the uh, in the in years later, because people like will look back and like some early stuff that they did. And, you know, if you attach themselves with you uh, to your project, that is definitely one way to approach. And I thought that was really some sound advice by John. Uh, moving yeah, us forward. No cool. Yeah, you know, oh, yeah, so I actually, I had a, uh, a YouTube sensation early on. This, this young man, uh, met him at a, at an acting class that I was, uh, guest teaching in and he went on and became this really popular YouTuber where he has like, I don't know, eight and a half million followers on Instagram and YouTube. Wow. This young man named Jacob Seratorius, I want to say. And he's in one of my just tiny little shorts, a little comedy that I did. And this young man boom, you know, took off. So I'm trying to keep good contact with him because, you know, as indies, if you if you can't always hit that A-lister, a YouTube sensation or YouTube star is certainly, uh, especially if you're going to be self-distributing, can be just as valuable and marketable um, as like an A-list talent. Yeah, any any unfair advantage you can get. Anything you yeah, can get, like, that. like yeah, to grab to to make your product um, unique and and exploit it to, you know, for those who are purist artists, I'd say exploit it. There's two words you can use. You can say exploit it or amplify it. <laughs> A lot of the yeah. artists prefer to use the word amplify. Uh, uh, my crass sort of sense of um, like business understanding, they would just say exploit. So if you want to just amplify it. So you um, amplify every unfair advantage that you have in your film, something unique, every angle you can get. Uh, you amplify it, amplify it to, uh, you know, get noticed. Cool. So with that said, we're going to go into the second part of uh, this episode's interviews. Uh, we are actually, I interviewed Darian Gibson, who's, she is the uh, head of SAG Indie 
And what we both of us both of us learn is um, there's a difference between SAG Indie and SAG the yeah. and, and AFTA. And so let's sit back and enjoy this really insightful interview with Darren Gibson, and then we'll come back and uh, comment later. All right. Just real quick, what is the difference between like SAG Indie? dot org because it's like this whole like on the website it's like different than just going to straight SAG AFTRA. Oh, you're absolutely right, and thank you so much for asking. That's one of our um, biggest issues is that SAG Indy is not a part of the union. We are a separate company. We work in conjunction with the union. We teach their low budget contracts to independent filmmakers, um, but we're not part of the union. We are completely separate. Our job is to make the relationship between SAG-AFTRA and independent uh, producers who are making lower budgeted films, our job is to make that relationship easier. We try to kind of answer a lot of the questions to make everybody really clear about what they're asking for when they go to SAG-AFTRA, what they can expect to get. And we try to just answer as many questions as we can before they get to SAG-AFTRA. Uh, my staff were full of filmmakers, so we kind of understand what people are trying to achieve, and then we try to guide them to the correct way of going about it. Oh, that's great! Actually, you know, I didn't, I didn't really know that, so I, that was fantastic. That's a, I'm glad that was the first question asked. <laughs> I, I know it's a difficult, weird thing, and our email address says SAG AFTRA because we're in the building, mm-hmm. so we we rent cheap, cheaper space from them. But um, but we're not a part of them, so it's a it's a constant uh, discussion. But it's an important one because people need to know where the information is coming, yeah. and we are a third party group, and our job is to be completely neutral. So we don't advocate or organize on behalf of SAG-AFTRA. Our job is to just give the truth as it stands, to tell people what is and what can and what cannot be, and. You know, ultimately, SAG-AFTRA will make their decisions themselves. We don't have a, um, the ability to override them, but sometimes we have the ability to influence their decisions. Sometimes we can kind of talk to them about what people are trying to do mm-hmm. and help them find the right way. But for the most part, we are, you know, we just kind of teach the contracts as they can be employed by filmmakers and we don't advocate one way or the other. We just try to give people the best information so that they can make the choice that's right for them. Nice. It's, it's definitely like not only for the independent film community, but like you said, just for SAG. Because SAG, you, you guys are kind of like the boots on the ground or you know ears to the you know to the to the to the audience or to the market, and that information can be very very valuable as they go through uh, all the decision making. And I know. There was a just recently there was a a, a change in uh, contracts. Was that correct with the new media or? Um, there have been um, changes over the last, I guess, little time. They're always uh, tweaking new media because new media changes so incredibly quickly. Um, as it happens, because of that, new media is their own department, and we do not um, do that contract. Oh, interesting. Um, now. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> so no, no, so that that's good to know. So, so SAG Indie is for the you know um, low budget, um, ultra low budget. The, you, 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 you help me there with like in terms of. So it's not for right. new media. So how how does that how does that work? We handle all theatrical contracts in the low budget arena. So we handle shorts. We handle ultra lows all the way up to the low budget contract, which goes up to two point five million or 3.75 uh, with diversity clause. So if it's meant to be uh, in a theater, if it's meant to go to a film festival, if it's that kind of a project, um, then it's a theatrical project. If it's meant to go online, if you your want is specifically to sell it to an online platform of any sort, then you're new media. But it's your intent that decides it. Do you want to go to festivals? If you had your best, you know, outcome ever, would it be that somebody buys it and puts it in a theater? Then you're theatrical. If you really just want an Amazon or a Netflix or an iTunes or whatever, then you're a new media. Interesting. So if they go down the path hoping for the theatrical um, 
uh, exhibit or distribution, but they don't get it. Where does the sh- where does the shift? Do they? Well, I I do think that we all understand <laughs> that where we plan to be and where we end up is not always in the same place. Right. Um, so yeah, if you start off at a theatrical and you go through the process and you go to festivals, et cetera, and it just does, your path doesn't happen that way, but you do get an opportunity to go online. Yeah. They're prepared for that. Um, there is a process, uh, by which they can kind of change you over to allow you to do what you want to do ultimately. But it, when you're starting out, you have to start with a contract that is headed to the place where you want to be the most. Oh, interesting. Okay. And so I'm assuming it could be, there might be a, 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 a case scenario where an independent producer uh, that says, I'm looking to get this on to Netflix and Amazon. And they go down that contract. But all of a sudden, some something happens where like, we want to put this in the theater. So then, then they'll, they would work with uh, SAG to work rework the contracts because... Um, now it has a theater option because sometimes Amazon does that. They'll, you know, they'll pick up something and then they'll do a theatrical run or whatnot. So I'm not too sure. Sh- yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it is completely possible. Um, it doesn't happen all that often going mm-hmm. that direction. Uh, certainly starting out theatrical and going to new media happens, you know, probably 95% of the time, but it does sometimes go the other way too, which um, in the past has not been the m- smoothest process, but it's actually m- uh, much better now um, because of the tweaks that have come along. There are some uh, things that have made that a little bit easier, but honestly, it doesn't go that direction uh, nearly as much. Did, um, from what I can recollect, you had, correct me if I'm wrong here, wasn't SAG Indy the organization, you that organization used to handle some early forms of new media because it was, wasn't really fleshed out. Um, was that the case? And then, and then, like you said, they, they moved and decided like, we'll take this and form a whole new, new department from that. Quite honestly, no, uh, for many years, SAG after when they developed their new media contracts had an entire new media department. Oh, so from the, um, from day one then. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now, and we worked very closely with them. And so we had a lot of understanding about what they were doing. And because our people, if you will, are much the same people, mm-hmm. we worked very closely together. But now they no longer have that department. And New Media is now a part of television's department. Hmm. And so um, it's a, it's moved away from from us and and our and our folk. Interesting. So what are the biggest like misnomers or misunderstandings that the independent film community has when coming to or trying to develop a project uh, in conjunction with SAG? You know, honestly, the biggest misconception is that you can't get who you want. Like if you have a dream cast that it they're impossible. Um, and there is honestly no one who is truly impossible uh, you know, it's a little field of dreams that if you write it and it's good, they will come. Um, but, you know, people forget that there's 160,000 members uh, at SAG-AFTRA. Some of them are very well known. Some of them are very well trained, but maybe not as well known. But at any given time, the vast majority, something like 97 percent, are unemployed on any <laughs> given day. You know, and yeah. this includes people who have television shows that are going or have or are doing movies but if you're doing a tv show and you have hiatus and downtime you know what are you doing with your time you if you something is really amazing yeah you want to do it and films are may take three months to do or four months to do but then it might be a year before you do another one so even the biggest you know actors that you know have downtime and will make it work if they really want to do your project. You just got to have the ability to to have something good and to ask and to get to them. Now, that's a hard part in itself. But if you can get to them and they love it and they want to do it, they'll, it can happen. And it won't break your bank necessarily. It, it doesn't have to be crazy expensive. You're obviously not going to offer somebody... 20 million now, you know, because mm-hmm. you're making an independent film 
everybody who makes an independent film, every actor, no matter how well known, they understand what an independent low budget film means. If you are independent and low budget, they get it. <laughs> they know it's not going to be money. They know it's not going to be lavish. And they're okay with that. If they want to do the project, they're not going to ask for a Learjet. That doesn't make good sense. Yeah, definitely. Let me ask you for your experience, your opinion. Like, let's let's dig deep into that one aspect of, all right, well, how does an independent producer get the, the name actor they want? Um, uh, and what resources does SAG Indy offer? Do they offer like uh, uh, workshops with different casting directors so, to know how to put a package together to make sure that the, the script and just like a professionalism is in place? Um, and like it's, again, I don't know, like if you were to give that sort of a roadmap or pathway, what would, you, what would be your advice? Well, um, SAG Indy, we do not handle casting part of it. SAG after has many more um, uh, venues through which to go through to help you with casting, including actors to locate, which you can call SAG after, tell them the actor that you're interested in, and they'll give you all the information of who their people are. They'll give you, you know, manager and they'll give you uh, agent, et cetera, and they'll give you that co- contact info. Um, they will not give home phone numbers and addresses. You'd be surprised. <laughs> right. You'd be shocked how many times people ask for that. <laughs> But, you know, so we let them handle that. But we do have this kind of basic idea. And it's this. There are know who you're asking and what you're asking them for. Not just the actor, but also uh, the agent or the manager. Because my I have done uh, helped people with casting before just because I have one of those minds where I remember people pretty Mm -hmm. easily. And. One of my tricks personally is that, you know, I am a constant reader of information and I have a lot of ridiculous information in my head that seems like it'll be useless until it's not. So I read People Magazine and InStyle and, you know, Us Weekly, and I keep little silly things of information in my head. But what that does is, you know, I remember when people talk about something that they like. This person loves to play guitar. This person actually sings. This person loves riding horses, et cetera. And then when I'm looking at, you know, at casting something, I say, oh, this one calls for horseback riding and this person loves to ride. That's an in, you mm-hmm. know, find your in. What will, what will appeal to them? Um, they are secretly a rodeo person, you know, that's an in. But if you're going to go to a manager or, um, or an agent, also be aware of what you're asking them for. Because a manager is going to understand that this person is really well known for being action, but they really want to sing or they really want to do comedy. And they'll actively look for things that are maybe off the beaten path for that person. Um, Agents of really bigger actors may not be quite as um, ready to do that to take them out of their lane, if you will. Mm-hmm. But now but now every agency has somebody, if not a whole department, looking at more interesting indie product. So they have packaging agents, they have uh, independent film group people. So you can go to them and they'll look and they'll say, does this work for what we're thinking of? Right. I think you have, you have to find your in and, and go for it, but know what you're selling them. This is a great project. I know they love to sing. This has a chance for them to not only, you know, sing a song, but, you know, show their acting chops, do a little comedy, whatever. Sell them on what, you know, what you think makes this something that they should want to do. There you go. That's some good stuff. Now, with with the SAG indie contracts and the, and the education you guys pr- provide, um, is there sort of like – like a like a common thing that comes up with independent producers not understanding or there some fears they have about the contract that you have to alleviate um you know i guess every contract's different but is there like a general sort of like oh it's not as bad as you think it is you know <laughs> I, I think they're all not as bad as people think they are um i will do this correction sag indy does not have contracts only sag aftra we only teach you how to get through those contracts um, and then we'll never look at them. We'll never see them. We'll never touch them. Like we're out of that. Once you go to SAG-AFTRA, you're theirs. 
we are where you can call and ask a question. Or if you're having a problem and you're not sure um, which way is the right way to go, you just call us. And probably the biggest thing about SAG Indy that makes us good is that we're just a free service. You can call us, you can email us at any given time and tell us what your problem is and we'll try to track it down and help you solve it. And we'll stay on the phone for as long as you need so you can talk out the issue. Um, and if we need to, we'll go to SAG after and try to find the answer for you. So our job is just to be a constant resource. The biggest thing that we deal with and the biggest thing that most people are afraid of is one that sag after is actually in the business of keeping you from making a movie which is the polar opposite of what their job is their job is to help their members work now they have a few really basic ideas that everybody should understand and that is please don't kill your actor please don't hurt your actor <laughs> You know, please yeah. let your actors sit down and have some food because a hungry actor is not a good actor, you know. And, you know, the fact of the matter is they have had to make these rules for a reason. They didn't start off with these rules. They found that they had to make these rules. So it's not that they're there trying to keep people from doing what they need to do by, you know, making them break for lunch. It's because if they don't say you have to, people will forget and not feed people or not let them go home when they still can drive safely. Yeah. So the, rule, the rules are very specifically there to protect people, not to treat them like, you know, pampered poodles. It's to keep them safe and keep them alive. So if you walk in with that attitude of I understand your job is to just help us all keep this industry going. And it doesn't go if people are getting hurt or killed or, you know, then the attitude you come to it is going to make a huge difference. And it's certainly going to make a huge difference to how sag after responds to you. If you come in saying, I understand, how can we do this together? They will do the same. Yeah, yeah. What is a, is there like when you get independent filmmakers calling the hotline, <laughs> what is, is there like a common question that's always asked of you guys? Um, it is, uh, how long will this project, you know, how long will it take me to, to be made signatory, um, mm. which we can kind of help them with and kind of not because we don't control it. Um, how much is it really going to cost me? Which is the truth of the matter is that's the bottom line for almost everybody. How much is it really going to cost? Because there are not a lot of things that are going to come around, but there are certainly parts that if you're not aware, it can cost you money. You know, understanding that every contract has a base number. The ultra low has a base of $125 a day plus pension and health. And you will never, ever, ever get out of paying for pension and health because actors need catch cold sometime and they need to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. So people want to know, well, what is pension and health? You know, we try to give them, you know, the information of how much more it'll cost. What does it mean when you're doing insurance? Um, what does it mean if my actor wants more? Because setting the floor does not mean an actor has to accept the floor. They can ask for more. You can also, as a filmmaker, choose not to pay them more. It's a negotiation at that point, and it's between the actor and the director and producer. sag after has no part in asking for above the floor, you know? Mm, yeah. So... Understand that any filmmaker who has a part and an actor who's interested, you all are equal partners in that negotiation. You can, you know, say we're only going to pay the 125 plus pension and health. That person could say, I really want 250 a day. And that's between them. Mm -hmm. Say no. Yeah. If you can't do it, say no. Yeah. It's perfectly fine. So how much is it really going to cost and what are the pitfalls? And there are pitfalls in everything that you do. So you have to just be aware of what is important and what is not. One thing is, you know, you're going to have to pay pension and health. So be aware. But the other thing is sag has a bond, which means if you have $10,000 in your budget for actors, sag is going to look at your budget and they're going to look at your script 
and they're not looking at your script to just make any judgment value on how well the script is. They're actually just looking for red flag moments. Um, something that says, hi, it's a, it's a hundred thousand dollar film. And then they read a sign that says, and then the actor jumps the grand Canyon and they go, <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh, Oh no. Or they look for things that say there's a fight on a freeway and there's no uh, stunt coordinator. They're looking for those things. They're not mm -hmm. looking for anything beyond that. But in the budget, it's gonna they're gonna look at ten thousand dollars for their for the cast, and they're going to say, okay, but your security bond is going to be roughly another ten thousand dollars. And what they do is they hold, depending on how long your film is, and they don't do it for shorts. But if it's a feature. If it's more than two um, weeks, there's a formula that they use. But anywhere from 50% to 100% of your actor's budget, they will ask to hold. And when you're paying your actors, it will not come out of that bond. Essentially, you have to have 200% of what you need so that they can hold that amount and you can pay out of the your amount. And what that does is it allows them to make sure that if it all just goes crazy not the independent film ever does mm. um and it all goes away after four days and producers disappear that there's still money to pay those actors for the days that they did work um if there is a claim against them if somebody gets hurt or if there's a problem there is money being held to handle that if everybody just disappears yeah what have you seen in terms of the proliferation of just content and people being able to make, you know, uh, content all over the place, all over the world. Um, are you finding like when they go down this road, they're like, Oh, like that's too much of a headache for me. I'm, I'm just going to go something, do something else. <laughs> well, certainly there's a, a amount of people who are just like, uh, I don't want to deal with this paperwork. I don't want to deal with This is too much. But my argument is always, this is, the industry and this is the job if you want to make a film and you don't want to deal with this that's fine then don't but if you want to make a career of this this is the time to do the paperwork because right now you're making it where your risk factor is 125 dollars a day you don't want to learn this paperwork when your budget is no longer you know 250 thousand but 2.5 million or 20 million, if you really have a career, you're going to only go up in budget. Learn it while the money is low and your mistakes are not going to be as costly. Nice. Later on, it can hurt you. Mm -hmm. And what? it doesn't change. Yeah, yeah. The paper, you know, the paperwork's the same. It, it gets slightly <laughs> bigger, but the paperwork at its core does not change in theory and in, in, in purpose from 250,000 to 250 million. It certainly increases a bit, but it, it, the idea behind everything does not really change that much. Right. So once you learn this, it's like learning the ABCs. You can have a really long word, but if you've learned the ABCs, you can get there. Yeah. What if, um, as we wrap up here, I could be uh, conscientious of your time. Was there something that I didn't ask you that I should have asked you that filmmakers should know about uh, the process or sagindie.org? Uh, I'm going to give probably the most important advice. It's two things that I try to tell every filmmaker about. Number one is whether you're doing a short in your apartment or a feature anywhere, you need workers' comp insurance. Everybody thinks that if I'm going to go for, you know, three day shoot in my apartment that nothing can happen, but things do happen. And what people don't realize is anybody working on your film, when they walk out of their front door of their home and go to the sidewalk, they are now on your dime. And if they fall off the sidewalk in front of their own home and break their ankle, the filmmaker will pay that bill without workers comp. If that person gets terribly hurt, even outside their home, you're going to pay hundreds and thousands of dollars. Get workers' comp insurance. It's like every other insurance. You think you, you hate paying it until you need it, and then you're so happy you do. Mm. So that's one. Two is when you finish your film and it's amazing and people are interested in it and somebody wants to distribute it, there is this paper that sag -AFTRA has given you called the Distributor's Assumption Agreement, which means that if 
I, the distributor, buy your the rights to your film and then try to sell it all over the world, one would assume. And every time I go, hey, Spain is giving me $5 million, the moment it plays in Spain, it's going to incur residuals. And there's going to be a residual bill that's going to go to those actors. If I, as a distributor, do not sign that form, that bill goes to the filmmaker. So if a filmmaker makes amazingly $5 million on their film, but the distributor keeps selling it again and again and again, they're going to keep getting a bill. And that bill can last forever. Every single time that distributor sells, there's going to be a bill. And that you do not want that bill to go to the filmmaker. So you must insist that the distributor sign a distributor's assumption agreement, which says every time they make money distributing it, they will take care of the residuals that will be incurred from it. How many cases have you seen where a independent producer producing team has not signed, got that signed and then they find themselves in, uh, underwater from it? More than I could ever count. Uh, the angriest, most bitter filmmakers are the ones who are like, I, you know, SAG after is sending me a bill for $40,000. I don't have $40,000. And uh, why didn't they help me? And I'm like, did you have this form signed? Well, no. And I'm like, well, that was your help. Um, And it's still only so much help, but at least it's the first defense of help is make them sign it. And if they, if you can't pay that bill and you keep getting it, then SAG-AFTRA has the right to actually take your film and, and auction it off to pay the actors the money that they're due. So, Why would you, you know, there is such a thing as a bad deal. Somebody who wants to sell your film and make a lot of money off it, but not pay the residuals on it. I don't know that that's a great deal. That's an expensive lesson to learn. Mm -hmm. How many of these, uh, there's a lot of these independent production companies, they they form like an LLC just for the Pedicure project, if they do at all. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm assuming that if they get themselves caught in this type of situation, the bankruptcy or closure is pretty high. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. You see, and the LLC is the uh, key because you don't want to do a film and be signatory to SAG AFTRA in your own like personal name. And then short shorts are a little bit different because they're much simpler, but for a feature film, you want an LLC one. It'll protect you from bankruptcy and things like that. So that of course they cannot then come and take your home. Or, you know, your assets, your personal assets. It is it is limited liability for a reason. It keeps the, a limit on your liability. But also, it means that only that film is signatory to SAG-AFTRA. So if I'm making a movie called Shoes, I will have Shoes, the movie, LLC. And that will be signatory to SAG-AFTRA and follow the rules. I, as an individual, still have the ability to do signatory and non-signatory work. And I can keep that status as long as I personally don't sign to SAG-AFTRA. When I get a company that's big enough and does enough work to sustain itself, I can make that company signatory to SAG-AFTRA. And then everything that company does will have to be signatory. Mm -hmm. Just real quick for those who may not understand, can you explain the signatory to uh, those uh, new filmmakers listening? Sure. So you have signatory status with SAG-AFTRA. Once you fill out all the paperwork, the paperwork, of course, on an independent low budget is still rather small. It will be, you know, your script, uh, your budget, your schedule, and then you're going to give them a cast list. You're going to tell them how many people are all in SAG-AFTRA, depending on what contract you use. Not everybody has to be in SAG-AFTRA or be a professional. The ultra low means you can mix and match. If you have 10 people who are, uh, have speaking lines and three of them are the most important, you can make them professionals, which is an important distinction, not just sag after professional. And the other seven can be complete amateurs. Mm-hmm. And these contracts will only cover the three. And the other seven are on you to negotiate pay to. But sag after wants no part of that. Um, so 
realize that you have options and ways of making that less difficult. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, great. I, I want to make sure I didn't uh, leave leave you hanging or leave something in some bit of information hanging. Uh, is there anything else that I should we should know about um, before we wrap up? Um, only to check out the incentives. If you're making something that is up, up, reaching the modified level, which is up to six hundred thousand dollars, and you're going to go higher than that, or you're you want to go higher than that. Uh, look at the diversity incentive. Um, mm. A modified actually goes up to seven hundred thousand. Excuse me, but diversity in casting means you get fifty percent higher on your uh, ceiling, mm -hmm. and you can stay in the modified level, which means you can go from seven hundred thousand to a million and fifty, and you will still pay modified budget uh, level, which is only three hundred and thirty-five dollars a day for your actor. So you can make a a million-dollar film and pay three hundred and thirty-five dollars a day for any. Film, any actor who will do it and you're saving a lot of money because honestly your film should look like the world in which you live right and so it should be full of people who are different ages different colors different abilities etc but also the uh regular price is nearly nine hundred dollars you're you're making a great savings um by using this so it's highly recommended and it should look like the world in which you live when do they implement that is this something in the last few years Diversity incentive? Yeah. No, that's been around for whew, over well over a decade. I that's don't know good. exactly. Yeah, I don't know if it's more than a decade, but it's certainly that long. Nice, nice. All right, well, Darian, thank you so much for your time and your. Th this has been huge. This is like this is sort of like the nuts and bolts. Like, well, if you're going to get into this, um, do this. And if you have any questions, and contact sagindy.org. Call uh, sagindy.org or give us a call. And we give a free workshop at SAG-AFTRA every second Thursday of every month in New York and in L.A., completely free. And we'll go through paperwork. We'll answer questions. But you can always just call us. We'll answer the phone at, with real human beings, and we will stay on the phone until you have the information you need. So, yeah, we're back. And, um, wow. So I had no idea. I was like, yeah, wow, I 0%. had no idea there was a difference between <laughs> SAG Indy and SAG. And yeah. so, um, and especially it's interesting that SAG Indy really has nothing to do with the, the, the digital, the new media contracts. Like SAG yeah. is really just encompassing themselves that way, which, you know, begs to differ. Like, you know, SAG Indy is really, unfortunately, their, their, their extent is stuck to theatrical and more or less, you know, yeah. and so I don't even know, like a lot of these projects that aim to become theatrical then have to switch halfway through because all the deals are coming through new media anyway. So I don't know. What, what were your thoughts? Yeah, no, I definitely had no idea that SAG Indy was a completely separate entity that was there to kind of support between at serve as a liaison between the producer and, and SAG. And so appreciate that they're there. I did a a low budget SAG independent film and they would have been invaluable for me to go there but because my assumption was that they were just an extension of SAG that I just kind of dismissed it as like I'm handling this on my own so um, you know I don't really need them had I been informed like we are now I certainly would have used them but you know it was again a lot of good information it doesn't make me feel as intimidated. I know a lot of indie producers feel that intimidation factor when they're trying to work with SAG simply because of the paperwork or I don't want to get myself boxed into a corner um, you know, of, of not being able to sell a certain way or having mm -hmm. to do deferred payments later on. How do I handle that? Or an actor's only, what are the parameters that are allowed certain hours to work and what are all these rules? Because when I signed up for my, my low budget SAG feature, they gave me like a Bible, you know, that yeah. was like huge. Yeah, yeah. And I said, am I responsible for all this? They said, absolutely. When you sign the contract, you're responsible for it. So if I had someone like a SAG Indie to serve as kind of this this liaison that I could go to, they would have been invaluable. And I kind of felt Darian's heart in that, that that is what they they really want to be utilized for to, yeah. to help us. Um, because a lot of times I'm just not going to use SAG actors because I just don't want that that pain point of having to try to figure it all out. And then here they are trying to help you figure it all out and break down that uh, barrier. So 
no, super excited next time to to reach out to them and and to use that. So I definitely plan on doing that. Yeah, it was really really inter- interesting. Cool. So as we wrap up this particular episode, I want to go back to um, the the John Gallagher interview. And actually, for those of you who are interested, I'm going to have the entire uh, interview with John Gallagher listed in the show notes for this episode. And um, the reason being is uh, he he gets into a lot of different other uh, topics um, that kind of stray away from the initial um, topic that I wanted to focus on, which was um, how to get a named actor. Um, onto your film but by all means it's worth checking out his extended interview um, on film trooper and that again will be at filmtrooper.com forward slash 139 for episode 139 so you can hear his full interview but before we leave i want you guys to kind of listen to some advice he has um because john survived a house fire you, you can hear him talk about it where he woke up and he was basically on fire because the apartment caught fire and you know he was in a wheelchair afterwards and what do you do how do you respond to that and you'll hear how he handles that and i think it's just sort of some good advice um or interesting uh, inspiring advice for all filmmakers moving yeah. forward so let's hear that p- little snippet from john before we uh, close out this episode you know what what can you bestow upon us like just in terms of your perspective of like what is well, the I real mean, secret of life yeah. in film and or beyond film just in general uh, listen it was a you know i was we were in pre-production on a movie i co-wrote and was producing called sam mm-hmm. that uh nick brooks mel brooks's son was directing it was his first feature and mel was the exec producer I came home, I fell asleep, I woke up six weeks later in a burn unit, and, uh, you know, I had, I had had three skin graft surgeries, I had kidney failure, I lost the ability to walk, yeah. um, they gave me a 10% chance of survival, it was not a pretty picture, and actually the film was made while I was in a, a coma, <laughs> and which is probably... I've had produced. I've worked with producers that I, I should have been in a coma while I was filming. <laughs> um, but you know, the the doctor said I couldn't work for several years, and I was terrified. I, however, well, was lucky enough that a buddy of mine, Steve Stanulis, an actor turned producer, actor slash producer, offered me a movie while I was lying in a hotel bed, and a month out of a wheelchair, I directed The Networker. Mm. with William Forsyth, Sean Young, Stephen Baldwin, and it's actually coming out, being launched by Sony's uh, company, The Orchard, yeah. on September 12th. And, you know, it was basically, and I shot it in 15 days, no overtime, um, really happy with the film. Um, and it, it harkened me back to when I directed my first feature, walk, going around trying to raise money, getting doors slammed in my face, being told you can't do it. And I did it. And New Line bought it. Hmm. And I still even get checks from that. Um, It was the same thing. I was told you can't do it. And I did it. So that, to me, is the lesson. Don't let anybody say, you, you let them say it. Say you can't do it, but then do it. Yeah. Because you can't do it. There's nothing you can't, there's nothing one cannot do. I mean, that's the lesson I learned was you just, you know, power through it. I mean, I, you know, what they do in the hospital, you, you know, when you're re- in recovering, they send in a psychiatrist who says, you know, are you feeling um, suicidal? And I would literally said to the guy, I said, no, I'm feeling homicidal. You ask me that one more time, I'm throwing you out the, out the window. And, uh, you know, so it, it's, that's your mindset. And you can set that. However, whatever spiritual or metaphysical thing you subscribe to, um, it's just that. You just, look, you got to be crazy to be in this business anyway. You yeah. got to you know, be prepared for massive rejection um, and people saying no and you know it's your job to turn turn that no into a yes and uh, and I'll tell you it also 
was I had two books unfinished. Um, one book on William Wellman with my co-author Frank Thompson and a book on Tay Garnett, the best known for uh, Post Man Always Rings Twice, the original. Mm-hmm. And so since I got out of the hospital, which was in, well, oh, geez, it's going, it's going to be, it'll be it's three years now. Hmm. I've directed a feature, I produced a feature, I directed two shorts, one of which played 35 film festivals and won 20 awards, um, and wrote probably four scripts and finished these two books. Because having come that close to death, Mm-hmm. It was like, oh damn! I better like, I better get this stuff done. I'm not ready to go. <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And uh, and I've actually been offered to write uh, a memoir, Confessions of an Indie Filmmaker, which I'm not quite ready to do. I'm gonna we'll wait for another couple of films. There you go. Because I don't want to, you know, I I want to name names. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, that's yeah, that's the gist of you. Just, you know, just don't take no for an answer. Don't let anybody say you can't do something. In reality, there's nothing you cannot do. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for taking your time with us and, uh, and it's me. It's a pleasure. Okay, yeah, we're back. And, yeah, that's pretty Man. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, it really it got me fired up. And, you know. You <laughs> don't don't say that word. <laughs> the oh, pun. <laughs> <that's true. laughs> yeah. Nice. Give me, give me, uh, give me. Yeah. yeah. But how, what, what <laughs> other words did you say? Sing- yeah. <laughs> No, he, he definitely got me passionate about uh, getting getting at it, you know, and and all the things that could come against you, and yet he just overcame it and said it so just like yeah, that's what I had to do, and that's what I did. I was in a you know in a coma. They weren't sure I was going to live, and and all these things. You just like wow, I can't believe he's even saying this. And then another adversity, and yet here I am complaining because. You know, I I I I can't get the next uh, red epic. <laughs> you know, I, I can't get the next piece of gear that I want. And and then he's he's talking about overcoming extreme adversity like that. Uh, and and you can tell that he's a storyteller because he he just pulled me right in as, as well. And and telling this and the passion that he has about what he needs to do because I believe personally that I'm called to this and that you know, that there is a reason that I am meant to be a storyteller. So I want to go after this with everything that I have. And and his passion just really carried over. And I, I caught that, you know, and, and mm-hmm. it uh, definitely was uh, contagious. So uh, not only was did he have invaluable information, but just that truly inspiring story that, that you want to hear that, you know, I am, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Well, thank God, I'm going to be this weekend, you know, pulling the trigger on the camera. And, yeah, yeah. And that that's what you want to do after hearing somebody like that. It, it was awesome. Yeah, he, I think, summed up that that that, that saying you probably heard before, which was um, either get, you know, well, I think it was, um, gosh, what's the film? Um, Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. Either you get busy dying yeah. or you get busy living. And definitely John said... All right. Well, I don't have much time. I better get going, yep. get start living, making a bunch of films and more. And so, that's what the takeaway should be for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they they have an interesting. Uh, they've done a lot of studies, and one of the studies that they've done when you're old and gray and dying on your bed, you you think that you're going to look back over your life and regret all the things that you did, but invariably you end up regretting all the things you didn't do. Mm-hmm. And, and no one wants to be, especially us creatives, us artists, we know we have a story deep within us that needs to come out. You don't want to go through life going, man, I should have told that story. You know, and, and it's why we're we're so passionate about what we do, you know? <laughs> and, and we all get caught up in that. And I certainly did when he was telling his story. And, and it made me want to ensure that I'm I'm telling mine. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, hey, that wraps up this episode in part two uh, of this series of how to get a named actor and work with SAG uh, for indie film. Um, where can people reach you again, Ron, the Indie Film Coach? Yeah, IndieFilmCoach.com. And then, of course, my studio is TheForgeStudios.com. Uh, Forge, so yeah, yeah. like Forge, yep. F-O-R-G-E. Yeah, like an anvil. Yeah, okay. Yep, you so got it. Cool. 
And then uh, we'll look forward to hearing about all the other, you know, progress you have uh, going in this week and, and all the, on this particular project you got going. Yeah, super excited about Weekend Warrior. Yeah, I'll definitely keep you guys posted on that one. You know, it is an interesting thing. We'll see We'll see how it all works out. And at minimum, I'll be able to learn a lot and uh, tell you all how we're, how we're doing things. Yeah, no problem. Um, and for all of you listening out there, do not go away empty-handed. There are a ton of free things over at free, um, at, at free at filmtrooper.com. In fact, we actually have a free members portal. Um, it's a it's a very valuable uh, re- resource and tool, and and you know available free to all the Film Trooper listeners. Just go to filmtrooper.com, look for the members portal uh, menu selection, hit that, and then sign up for the members portal, um, as well as um, Get a free gear, uh, guide, a free gear guide of um, over at freegearguide.com. It's an equipment list of everything that I use to make a feature film without a crew. Yeah, <laughs> over at freegearguide.com. All right, guys. Ron, thank you so much for hanging in with me. And I really enjoyed this episode. And I will look forward to seeing everybody, you know, here and there. Or what's the word? I can't see everybody. But we'll be out there again very shortly with our next episode. <laughs> Trooper, empowering filmmaking entrepreneurs.